the question would be, what is your goal? And what is your vision? And would money and having more of it facilitate that vision to happen faster, ah. more effectively, and have more deeper widening impact? This is the question. Business of Architecture, episode 414. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and I'll be the host for today's episode, where you'll be listening in on a conversation that I had with Business of Architecture director Ryan Willard. In this episode, we talk about money scripts. It was very early in my career that I realized that there were a number of things that were holding me back from having the financial success that I was hoping to have in my life. And what I discovered is that it had more to do with about how I saw money and the conversations and the stories and narratives that I told myself about finances and money that went on between my own ears as opposed to any particular actions that I took. What I discovered was that these narratives or thoughts or beliefs or however you wish to call them, scripts, had very important, almost prophetic potential to determine my results. So with that, here's the episode with Ryan Willard on money scripts. Now, we'd love to have you join the conversation. Head on over to Facebook and join the Business of Architecture Forum on Facebook. It's a private group. You'll be able to request access. And we'd love to have you join us over there for the conversation. So with that, here's today's episode on money scripts. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. Enix Sears here, joined today by my co-host... Ryan Willard. And the topic of today, this is actually Business of Architecture Unscripted. It is currently 9.30 p.m. on a Friday night, and we're doing what a couple of guys without much social lives <laughs> and, and do, which is recording a podcast. Fantastic. I and so it. we were having a chat about the topic for today was going to be on money scripts, and we have some very interesting oh. kind of comments that were sent in. Yeah. And we're going to go over. We do, and it's particularly apt because I just finished my interview with um, Dr. Brad Klonst, who was a money psychologist and was talking about how money scripts dictate our relationship to finances and our ability to build wealth. Um, and we were looking at some of the mythologies that are often revered in the architectural industry of famous but broke architects from Frank Lloyd Wright, who famously would like to sort of give away his money in order to kind of um, create a kind of creative fervor because he worked better. I, I need to get some buildings done immediately. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> the pressure it, is on. Exactly. It's, I work better when broke to Louis Kahn as well. So we, we have to be responsible that in the industry and in our education, there is a glamorization of the broke architect. Interesting. And that, that's the kind of narrative that we, we adopt. And it kind of subconsciously, we end up associating, well, if you're getting paid well, then you must be doing bad work. Podcast listeners, what do you think? Is this, is this true? Do you, do you agree that there is a glamorization of the broke architect? I know that one of the kind of comedic releases I usually do when I'm doing like a live presentation, for instance, I've got him up on stage and stuff. I'll, I'll sometimes say, you know, kind of telling my story, how I got into architecture. I said, of course. And then I went to architecture school because I, I, I knew that architects made so much money. And of course, everyone in the audience laughs. <laughs> so there must be some truth to that. If, if it's funny enough to laugh at it, when I say that you know, we're in it for the money, uh, there must be a, must be something there. It's interesting as well. I remember when I first started university, uh, the tutors saying we're often we're often given this narrative of like architecture is a vocation and it's a calling and it calls you and that we don't do it for the money and I remember that almost like day one or two there was an actually an explicit conversation about you know you're about to embark on this journey you guys don't really know anything about architecture you don't really know why you're here but it's going to take this incredibly long period of time and then you're going to work in a profession where typically you won't get paid. But, and this is the big but, there is the kind of what we're doing is noble. It's and important. It's important, which it is. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing that and, you know, I'm a lover of architecture and architectural process and an advocate for the power of buildings for society and the power of architectural thinking. Um, but we just have to be responsible for that it's often attached with those other narratives around money. And, you know, how do we reconcile a passion 
or a craft or an art or something that we give our heart to with commerce. And we, we were talking before about we kind of had this shared thing where I started architecture school because of the the idea of social impact. I wanted to do something that wasn't just a nine to five job. So I was totally disenchanted with the idea of going to work just for money. And in my mind, I thought that pretty much every other profession, they were just in it for the money and people just hated their jobs. You know, as, as a youth, as a teenager, I looked around the people that I saw and just thought, wow, their lives just look miserable, just doing what they hate just so they can bring home a paycheck. I'm going to do something different. And I considered being an artist, but I said, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to be that different. I actually want to. I actually <laughs> want to raise much. a family. Yeah. I actually want to have a paycheck. So I thought, you know what? Architecture is probably a nice, a nice medium there where you can actually. It's a profession. You can earn a salary, but at the same time, it's not all about the money. I'll be able to do something that I'm passionate about, that I love. And yeah, money was definitely not on the top of the list of why I was doing it. But what was interesting is my perception of what other people got out of their jobs. It was very cynical. It was very superior, as a matter of fact. Like, I kind of viewed myself as morally or intellectually superior to all these other uh, the unhappy masses who were out there grinding away at the slave wheel while I was pursuing this noble profession of architecture and eschewing money, you know, saying, well, money's not the most important thing. I'm going to go do something I'm passionate about, and whatever money comes along to support my lifestyle, at least I'm doing something I love. Interesting. It's quite judgmental in a way. Oh, very much. I, I, I've had very similar judgments of other people. I, mean, I remember at university, again, kind of holding myself to a, a, a sort of standard of like, well, at least I'm doing something that's A, benefiting society and is my passion. And that's the most important thing. And, you know, people who are just working jobs just to get a paycheck, uh, you know, and and also the the yeah the arrogance of thinking that other people don't enjoy their jobs as well, or thinking that I know what other people's jobs are even are, even about. Yeah, and thinking thinking that I mean I I honestly thought the the only reason they're doing it is because they chose the road where they wanted to go for safety and security and money instead of creative expression. So it's just inherently in that there is a judgment that I was having against all these other people, and it wasn't until I started to make this transition into business of architecture. And getting out of professional services being my primary form of income, mm. that I suddenly understood that there's so much creative expression in so many different professions. I, I actually, right now, I actually view architecture as, as a field, anyways, for me that isn't as creative. Yeah. Now, having said that, it probably depends on what role you're playing in what kind of firm, because there's some architects, like I would say, in my perception of the industry, there's maybe. 3% who are on the design teams of, of large firms, those guys and ladies have charmed lives. I've kind of interned at one of those firms once. It's absolutely fun. You get a sketch all day long. You're doing renderings. It's everything you thought architecture would be. You're just doing the design, and then you hand it down to the second floor peons who are going to crank out the construction documents. But realistically, over my career, I was never on just a design team where that's all we did because you need to have a large firm to do that, right? So you have, because design is only maybe 5% of a project when you look at the total lifespan. And so you need to have quite a number of projects and team members and flow of projects to be able to have five people exclusively on design 24-7. And so my reality as an architect, of course, was reflected ceiling plans, figuring out how the tile was going to lay out in the shower, right? Making sure that the turning radius of the toilet and the, you know, the toilet didn't go into the ADA turning radius and trying to figure out everything about fire rated corridors. And it was very different. You know, so there's the amount of creativity there, right? I, I, I tried to get the joy out of the creativity of drawing little details or, you know, making making that column plan detail, you know, kind of where the metal studs go. So there's little puzzles, but to me, the actual practice of architecture as a whole, in terms of what I was doing in a smaller firm, it was very dry and it was it was difficult to get through the day because I just didn't feel like my creative juices were being challenged and stimulated mm -hmm. enough. That's very very interesting, and I'm sure an experience that lots of people can relate to. Um, again, I had a, a similar sort of experience. Went to university, in, intensely creative experience at university, where you were really an, allowed to go off onto wild, divergent patterns of thought and creative ideas and all that kind of stuff. 
And then the real world of architecture, I found very different to that, starkly different, like almost unrecognizable. And you, you went to the Bartlett. Yes. Right, which is a very theoretical, very high on the theory side in yeah. terms of the, their academic education. Yes. And of course, I, I went to Cornell in the U.S., which is kind of sounds very similar, but it's very much on, it's all about the theory of architecture. Yeah, the speculation, what architecture could be, which is a fascinating conversation. And again, like, you know, what we do with business of architecture, I think that is, this is a valid practice of architecture, just in a totally different way. Well, that that's interesting because when I when I finally began to glimpse what other the joy and satisfaction other people could get from the process of creation, I suddenly began to understand that everyone in whatever field they're in, as long as they're in something that that gives them joy and passion, they have creative moments all the time, and they can experience that. It doesn't need to be art. It doesn't need to be sketching. It doesn't need to be creating a chipboard model or doing some rendering. This sort of visual creative. Now, of course, that's highly rewarding. Of course, I know how it feels when you look at a building that you helped design and that you were a part of that process. That is an, a huge payoff. What I found, however, is that in my case, the payoff didn't come quick enough. It's mm-hmm. like you might work on a project for four or five months, six months, a year even before you get that payoff. Whereas, for instance, I, I dabbled in web design and I was like, yeah, I can right, get right, that right. payoff in three days. Yeah. Like, this is amazing. Yeah, you know, and so that kind of opened my mind to to say, you know what, there are other creative professions out there. We get these creative endeavors where people are able to to experience that same, you know, that same creative process. Yeah, I guess I, just in a different way. I, I think it's very uh, blinkered to think that the arts are where creativity lies. I think that's a real big misnomer. Um, I mean, it's we can kind of see it at the higher levels of science and mathematics. That's a very that becomes a very creative endeavor. You need leaps of intuition and creative thinking to be able to solve complex problems. Um, but yeah, I mean, I find for me personally, and I've you know I've been in an avant-garde architectural school. I've been in an avant-garde rock band that was a very highly specialized form of self-expression that was very creative. And actually, running a business is if not more creative than either of those. I agree. And that's the the passion I, I have for business now is because business, what I found with the actual practice of architecture, now I'm, I'm excluding the design teams. I think design teams are very similar to a school environment. Mm. If you're just designing all the time, that can be highly creative and highly rewarding in the sense that I thought architecture was, right? However, with, with the actual practice of architecture, where you're, you're taking into account all the variables that need to happen in a project, whether it's codes, fire ratings, officials, the budgets for the projects, everything, you know, just the details, the CAD drawings, the very nitty gritty, the engineering, coordinating with the MEP guys, making sure that the outlets are in the right spots, everything like that, right? Making, you're going down the checklist of equipment, making sure it's the right voltage and the right place and everything, yeah, yeah. right? These things, they can, they can be very dry. I mean, let, let's face it, they, they, <laughs> to put it lightly, they, they can be very, very dry. No, I know. no. I know it's, window schedule dry. It's, 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 it's hard to believe. of creativity. Now, door schedules, don't even get me started. Do you, do you like door schedules? I mean, going, going, making sure the door schedule match. Even when we use Revit, where everything's supposed to be automatic, I mean, you still have to go through and make sure you have the right passage set on the right door, you know, oh. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's the kind of the things you end up doing in architectural practice or the sort of large monotonous tasks that can happen. And also the kind of constant iteration of various things that might not actually seem like cause it can be very sort of minuscule, particularly on large infrastructure projects. So I worked in some big practices where uh, we were doing lots of large infrastructure scale projects that moves at even a slower pace. Uh, and again, I think it's a kind of personality thing as well like how quickly you want to see something resolved but that said I I mean I worked at Rogers on numerous competition entries in fact that was my sort of role and I'd often be dropped into uh, a team and you know do little hand sketches and the colorful pretty pictures and all that kind of stuff and within those tasks there's quite a lot of creativity Um, but again I, I, I think when you compare it to business and particularly even the the creative side of designing your own business and i think at the business of architecture what we're passionate about is seeing your business as something that is a creative 
a live element expression yeah creative expression of your ideals exactly and it's the that is the generator of all of your architectural ideas and it is design and it's the most important design because it's where all other design takes place so to be able to be masterful at all the different components and understand it and structure it and kind of treat it like an architectural project in itself where you've, you've got a kind of overarching vision for where it's going, what it's doing, all the different parts of it, and then all the different mechanisms inside of it. Some of them are financial. Okay, it's hard to be creative with with spreadsheets as to a de- you know if you just do- outsource that if, if that's you're just, what bookkeepers yeah, are for if you're just accounts. doing bookkeeping like that's like the least creative element to it however the way that you earn money the way that you think about money which um the balance sheets and profit and loss sheets become a sort of reflection of can be very creative the sort of deals that you're you're working on the communication internally is massively creative marketing my goodness, I think marketing is like the most innovative and creative industry that exists. Yeah, pretty much. You, you, you were telling me about the book Alchemy by... Rory by, Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Rory Sutherland is the vice president of uh, Ogilvy in the UK. And he talks about kind of logic and psychologic. And he talks about how human beings make decisions based on the emotional, instinctual drivers of the brain and then post-rationalize with, you know, logic. And so the emotional and the, uh, and the instinctual logic is kind of, in, you know, personalized to the individual and that's what he calls psychologic. And within that psychologic is where marketers can play, it's where you can craft messages, it's where you can start being really, really super creative to start making magic, as he calls it, happen. He was saying in the worlds of physics and structure, it's difficult to make magic happen. It's difficult to make a building float, for example. But within the world of perception um, and how things appear, that's where like magic can actually actually happen, and you can completely transform um, a, a customer experience through being very thoughtful. Um, a good example of that, for example, is um, they did some work on with TFL. Uh, which is the Transport for London, and they wanted to improve their customer experience. And TfL were thinking about enlarging the carriages, making the tracks bigger, uh, you know, so they could increase capacity for people, so they could get more customers on the train. Um, You know, they were thinking about improving other types of services, the the thermal conditions in the summertime under the tunnels, all these really expensive solutions and Ogilvy suggested, well, one thing that you could do that would totally transform the customer experience is to have timetables or to have um, the time displays up on the tracks, like every single platform you go to. Is that what those are? Yeah, so it, it tells you this train is coming and it tells you the time. So it says three minutes to the next train. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because they discovered that the most frustrating part of waiting for a train was not knowing when it was going to come. So it's this kind of, that for me is design, it's creative, and it's kind of, you know, it's part of the world of marketing and perception and uh, is where a lot of this creative joy in business can come because when you get to start to craft your message and you start to understand what's happening in the experience of your customers and your the people that you're working with this is where you can start to improvise and draw upon a real richness of ideas from all sorts of different sources which is you know it's, it's an art it's definitely an art and you know speaking of architecture it it does have there's a lot of constraints around like archi- much are many pieces of architecture they're very formulaic very formulaic they're a kit of parts I mean, 5 8 inch shipboard over sheet metal studs, you know, you have your 16-gauge sheet metal studs, your 14-gauge or whatever, your 18-gauge, you know, for a strip center. You know, you know how your plaster details are going to work, you know what kind of, you know, you're just pulling out the same details, and it's just like a kit of parts that you're putting together. And so it's interesting that architecture, there's so many constraints on the practice of architecture now. As I mentioned before, everything from codes to the the limitations of building technology, yeah. right, to the stakeholders that have budgets and things like that, right? So it's very constrained. However, going back to this idea of business and designing business, 
What I love about the game of business is that there are no there are no limits. Yeah. It's a limit it's it's an open canvas. Yeah. There's no one telling you that you have to do it this way as long as you're within the bounds of the law. Yeah. And now, you know, as and long as you're doing some, you know, yeah, not, you know, then, then all is fair game. Yeah. Right. As long as you're, you're operating within the limits that society has established for commerce and capital, you can, you can create your own future. And that's, that's, to me, that's a huge canvas to play upon. That's mm. pretty exciting. And some firms are playing in that, in that canvas. I think, you know, big out of, uh, out of Denmark, of course, they have offices all over the world. Uh, but they're doing some very interesting things in their business model, kind of really playing the way Bjarke Ingels, you know, you'll see him on Instagram. It just seems like he's constantly traveling around, like going to fun, fun, like he's at Burning Man one week, and the next week he's in, he's in Austin, Texas, you know. But the kind of work they're doing and the way they're kind of, his approach to being more radical about the practice of architecture and the business of architecture is very interesting. Uh, so going back to that idea of creative expression, it is interesting that my mind was open to entrepreneurship to me is one of the most creative fields out there. Yeah. Just creating something out of thin air, bringing together resources, mobilizing team members. And this is almost an added joy or outlet that architects can have once they apply their design thinking to their business. Yes. Yeah. And totally. that's what our message is here, right? Yeah. And I love what you just said there about the definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who brings together different resources and kind of combines it in a new way that for me is that's what architects do so what we do when we're designing a building we're kind of bringing together different ideas from the client from the constraints from the from the site from our own experiences and we're bringing it together in a new building system we're designing a system essentially and that's what architecture is and when you're designing a business you're designing systems and you're bringing together these different resources and you're creating something which has got a new value to it and th this is the magic as well and when we start realizing that's what we're that's what you're doing as an entrepreneur it's again it's like it's play it's yeah. so playful and it's so creative and you can just do so many different things i i often hear um when i love property and i love the property world and kind of fell in love with a lot of property uh people's way of thinking about business because they're so creative with the way that deals get done they're so creative with the way that they find finance for a project and there's this kind of performance element to it as well like you know sometimes the the solution can be something so simple but we might not do it because of our own internal mental blocks just for like for example raising money is basically asking somebody for money you are asking another human being for money now in that very simple request which sounds easy enough to say is a whole world of emotion of fear anxieties worries thoughts and this is why most businesses at some point or when you're looking for money have problems because there's some difficulty around making that request like how do you make that request how do you communicate it how do you um, provide it so it's landing of value to the other person and the property world gets very very creative in the way that they structure those conversations the way that they play with those conversations the way that they you know when you hear developers often they don't often sometimes they don't put any of their own money down into a deal they're using other people's money. So this is this those kind of dirty developers, Ryan. Nasty. Are you people. holding them up to be an example here? Uh, these the horrible capitalists. I know. What are you talking these horrible about? Horrible capitalists. Capitalist dogs. But when we start taking an appreciation for the creativity that resides in how property deals and financing is structured, I think we can relate to it as architects as being another another art and it also gives us a, a way to start communicating the value that we have as designers um to start bringing that into the conversation and we can start we can start doing the same thing uh with our own fees and this is you know some of the most inspiring business owners i've spoken to architects recently uh they've been very creative with the way that they've structured their fees the way that they've um approached their value proposition to their clients so rather than the kind of exchanging time for money, which is 
which is so it's so uninventive. 1980s. I mean, let's just yeah. face it, Ryan. It's just 1980s. Like, it's medieval. Medieval. That's <laughs> even better. It's really, really old school. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. Excuse me. It's it's just it's just an old fashioned way. It's not how people are getting rich in the world. Um, if your goal is to get rich, Ryan. And what if your goal is not to get rich? Well, the question would be: What is your goal? And what is your vision? And would money and having more of it facilitate that vision to happen faster, ah. more effectively, and have more deeper, widening impact? This is the question. I think it kind of links into the email that you had. Yeah, let's recently. leave him, let's leave them on that cliffhanger. Yeah, this will be this. We'll will, be we're going to continue this episode. Uh, but we did get some hate mail. So our next episode... <laughs> now, when you're a public figure, let me just put this out there. When you become a public figure, and, you know, we are public figures, just huge public figures, as I'm sure you know. Right? It's so, difficult to walk around London. It is. At the moment, <laughs> with, the, with the flocks of yeah, fans. Of asking course, for... of course. Uh, but, you you know, even with our minor celebrity status that we have, we have attracted our fair share of hate mail. So in the following episode, we're going to go over... Two examples of one was literally hate mail. The other one was more of a comment that kind of illustrated some an architect's mindset about some of the content that I had shared. Uh, but it would definitely be count in the criticism category. So that's your cliffhanger, uh, cliffhanger for today. And uh, we'll, we'll get on to that in the next episode. Sounds okay. good, right? Sounds brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.